Good evening, everyone. Welcome to session seven of City University. Tonight's class is dedicated to the police department and we will be learning all about everything that they do and plans for the future. We have a few very special videos that were recorded just for our virtual City University class. So we are excited to show you those. In the future, we hope to go back to regularly scheduled activities and we can provide some more interactive experiences with the police department. But for tonight, it's uh, just as nice because we have a very special presenter here to tell you all about the police department. So thank you all very much for joining us and I'd love to welcome Chief Bolduck. Thank you, Alex. Well, folks, uh, I'm Chief John Bolduck, and I have to say this is really awkward. Um, <laughs> uh, so a lot of things over the last six to eight months have been awkward. But um, what I want you to do tonight is I want you to have some fun with me. I want to have an exchange of information. I do not want to kill you with PowerPoint. Um, so I've Got plenty of slides to show you, but if it's just me lecturing and showing you PowerPoint slides, it's not going to be a real fun night. So uh, Alex tells me that uh, you're not big on unmuting and asking questions. So uh, the first person to unmute and ask a question is going to get a prize. Yeah. And, and hey, we'll... Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, hello, Chief. Uh, I'm Stefan Obert. Uh, I typed in my question earlier already. Um, so uh, I had, um, uh, can you explain to us uh, what are the circumstances when somebody should call 911 um, or the, the non-emergency number? Okay, that's a great question. I get that all the time. So when 911 originally came out, it was an emergency only number and, and you would see emergencies only in the logos. Um, you still see 911 emergency because we're still trying to convince people, um, you know, that that's the number to call for an emergency. Um, the, you know, the old joke is you call 911 uh, and people can't find, some people can't find the 11 on the phone, but see, we told you it's gonna be a rough night. You guys aren't mm -hmm. laughing. I can't hear you laughing. <laughs> All right, so anyway. Um, I'll laugh out loud. There you go. Um, 911 is the di most direct path to a police officer. So if you call the 871-5000 number that's listed for the police department, you're calling the police department, especially after hours, then they have to transfer that call to the dispatcher who works out at the 911 emergency dispatch center where Midway Road and State Road 70 meet. So that tells you how far out that is. So you're just adding a delay to the person who actually is the information, cat gathers information and passes it to the police officer. So the way our system is set up here in St. Lucie County, um, the call takers and the dispatchers are uh, in direct communication with the police officers and that's, that's how you get information to a police officer. So it doesn't have to be an emergency, it could be, um, you know, something innoc as innocuous as um, there's a car that speeds on my street every, every day at such and such time. And uh, that information would get passed on to the police officer. However, if you call up the 871-5000 number and leave the same information, we'll get it to the officer that works that zone during that time. Uh, I hope, did that answer your question? All right, Alex, you're going to keep a running Actually, list of names. I want to add something to that. Okay. If you don't mind. Um, uh, uh, you did answer the question perfectly. However, um, let's just put it this way. Um, what you pointed out now was basically that um, uh, the, the speed, how fast information is going to get to them. Um, a police officer. Um, what about somebody actually showing up at your headquarters across from City Hall um, to report something there? 
Um, it is my understanding that there is nobody in the building, but that then actually uh, officers from the street are being called back there. Is that correct? From during normal business hours, Monday through Friday, eight to five, we do have an officer working in the lobby, but at night and on the weekends, we do have to call the officer that works this patrol zone here in to take that report, yes. Yeah. So, so it is always really, because I remember uh, in a different jurisdiction when I called uh, 911 in the past, I got schooled, this is only for emergency. And here it's kind of the opposite. Uh, and that I just want to make sure because I think that is important for citizens to understand um, that really that is the correct way while somewhere else somebody might have told you in the past, don't call 911 unless it's an emergency, that we actually should do that here. And then apparently the way you explained it for a very good reason. Exactly. It, it, you're, you're absolutely right. And we're just trying to streamline it. If you need need a police officer, need to talk to a police officer, or want to pass information to a police officer, you can call one number, and you'll get you get the same result without being transferred from another number. And okay. they have multiple call right. takers. I appreciate that. Yeah. Really quick, Chief. Um, there was an additional kind of spinoff on that question. What about being charged for calling nine one one for a non emergency? I don't think I've ever heard of that. No, there's no. There's no charge for calling 911 and there's no charge for a police officer coming to your house. Um, we don't we don't get to charge a fee. Okay, I have heard sometimes it could have been, you know, a, a rumor, but that sometimes when alarms get tripped falsely, you might get charged for that. Yes, so for an alarm, if, if you have an alarm on your house, and I, I don't remember the exact criteria, I think it's three false alarms in a year or three false alarms in six months, then there is there is a fee, and uh, that is that is that program is administered by a third party administrator, uh, actually called, believe it or not, Cry Wolf. That's the name of the company. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> pretty innovative. But um, and that was because we were spending so much time chasing false alarms around the city, um, and we we had to implement that. People okay. just would not maintain them, and, and you'd go to the same house ten times in one shift, mm -hmm. and so. But, um, Thank you for that. I'll make sure Stefan gets his price. All right. Are you going to keep a list for me? Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm going to start with the uh, presentation. Um, again, during my presentation, I, I really want this to be interactive. So um, either send it in via chat or unmute and get my attention, and uh, I'll answer your question. Because some of this is a little dry. You know, they wanted me to talk about budgets and uh, some other stuff. So um, it, we, we can always use some good humor here and, and I love the challenge. And I certainly don't want anybody to go away going, I don't believe what he just said. Ask for clarification, please. So we open up with our mission statement and our value statement. And I won't read them to you because I believe you all can see them on the screen. Can everybody see, see everything on the screen okay? Yes, give me a thumbs up. All right, good. All right, so uh, about eight years ago, I became chief, and we, it was a, the department was going through a major change, so I sat the command, command staff down, and I asked everybody in the room, I said, can uh, anybody recite our mission statement to me? And nobody in the room could tell me what the police department's mission statement was um, because it was over a page long. So I said, we're gonna shorten it to one sentence that everybody can remember, and uh, there won't be any confusion. So if you're familiar with our patch, which is on the page, um, and you look at our mission statement, um, you'll notice that most of the words in the mission statement are on the patch in some way or another. And it basically says, through courage, knowledge, and integrity, the Port St. Lucie Police Department, all that's on the patch, so that should be easy, committed to superior customer service and remaining one of America's safest cities. And that's really, that is the mission superior customer service, and remaining the safest city. One great thing we got going for us, everybody that works at the police department right now inherited a safe city. The city started in 1961. It was never a bad city, never had a high crime rate, and um, we intend to keep it that way, even as it grows through 200,000 in population. 
So then we worked on our value statements, and uh, now it gets, it gets a little bit harder, and I'm not going to read them to you. I'm going to let you read, read them, but, um, you know, protecting and, and preserving constitutional rights. I think everybody wants that from their police department. Um, service to the community. Accountability. Uh, accountability was a big deal um, back then, and it's become a big deal again nowadays for a lot of police stations police departments in the country. Um, we feel very strongly about accountability and we actually have a program where we hold each other accountable um, in our daily task. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but ethical and moral conduct. I think we look around the country right now and we see um, where some unethical and unmoral police conduct has really caused uh, not only police officers, but police administrations in entire cities of people, a lot of heartache. Um, so we feel very strongly about that. Respect for people. I, I think that goes without, I think goes without saying. Um, and uh, empowerment. And, and, and empowerment's a little bit different. Empowerment, the police department believes that we achieve excellence through participation from the community. And if you think about it, um, you know, we're public servants and we solely exist in this position to serve this community. And uh, I always tell new people when I hire them, I say, look, um, you're coming to work for the Port St. Lucie Police Department and the Port St. Lucie Police Department has to be the best. And then they kind of look at me like, you know, why? And uh, it's real simple. Sheriff Mascara can do the same job that we do and you're already paying him taxes. So, if we want to keep our jobs, we have to do it better and be more attentive to the people who live in the city's needs than we think he would be. And uh, he and I go back and forth about this all the time, but uh, we don't have a monopoly on law enforcement in this community. We could very easily lose, um, if, if we weren't providing superior customer service, we would lose that ability. And uh, I worked here when it was actually something that was being bantered around in the community. So it is real. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, we know from uh, experience now, um, community policing really works. Uh, there's 261, oh, I blew it. That was one of my questions. Well, never mind. forget I said that. There's only a few of us. This is hard, They're not, I can't see them laughing. Uh, there's, there's only a few of us, and there's 200,000 residents here. So without the assistance of the community, um, there's no way we can keep this community safe. So to be effective, we need our community. Accreditation. So one of the things that uh, our police department has going for it is accreditation. And... Um, it's kind of hard to explain, so I'm just going to tell you what it is and what it's like to be the chief of police during an accreditation cycle, and then I'll tell you how that benefits the community. Um, we just finished our CALEA accreditation. That's the one with the, the blue banners and the, uh, the eagle in the middle of it. And CALEA stands for the Commission on Law Enforcement Accreditation. And, and it's an international uh, accrediting body. Um, they take it very, very serious. Um, you can see there on the slide, they have 463 standards that we have to meet. And every four years, they send a team down to the police department to spend a week with us to go over our policies. Um, well, each year, they, they take one quarter of our policies and they go through them and compare them to the standards to make sure our policies are up, up to snuff. And, uh, and then every four years they come on site and uh, when they're on site they interview citizens they interview uh, prominent people in the community um, they have an open forum right here in the council chambers and uh, you know obviously they interview me a lot and uh, what they're looking for is um, do we meet their standards to carry that pin or wear that sticker on our vehicle and uh, it's all about professionalism, it's all about best practices, and it's all about staying current on policies and procedures. So, you know, as the chief, 
you know, when I came to work here, we were accredited by CALEA, and we're just getting our accreditation from the Florida Commission. And that was 25 years ago. And so that's been going on that long in this community, in this organization. So I certainly don't want to be the chief to uh, fail to re be reaccredited when it comes around. And uh, Sounds like a plan, chief. Yeah. So one of the interesting, interesting things about accreditation, that's why it's good for the community, is um, following um, the incident in Minneapolis with George Floyd, um, there's been a lot of call for police reform, and uh, we've, we've been fielding those calls and fielding those emails. Um, one of them, one of the most prominent, and the one I was interviewed on uh, a radio show about was the hashtag eight can't wait. The eight simple principles that if police would stop doing these things or start doing these things, um, the people wouldn't be upset with the way they do their business, how, how they go about doing their business. When I went through the all eight items, every single one of those had been banned by one or the other or both of these particular accrediting um, bodies. And I had very easy answers for every one of them because we are accredited and we do live up to their to their standards. So. That's what it does for the community. Um, it's, it's nice for the city officials that sit behind me normally to know that we're accredited and that the chief's not going off and uh, making up rules and doing crazy things with the police department. And it's good for the chief because the chief knows that uh, somebody's watching over the department and making sure that the way we do business is absolutely the best practice in the business. Um, Less than 5% of the police agencies in the country are CALEA accredited. And wow. uh, we're the only one on the Treasure Coast that has both. So that's fantastic. A little tidbit there. All right. Any questions there on are, accreditation? Yes, there are a couple of questions. All right. um, not exactly on accreditation, but what are the requirements to become a PSL police officer? Are we going to get into that, or do you want to touch on that now? Well, I don't think I have a recruiting spiel in here. But is there anybody out there? Raise your hand if you're looking for a job. i got about 15 openings right now. 15? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, the requirements are to be 19 years old, to be a high school graduate with preferably either college or military experience. So we're not looking for just high school graduates. Um, we're either looking for someone who has been in the military or has um, completed a couple of years of college. Um, what we do uh, very much like is at the Indian River State College, they have this thing called career track. And if you go up there for your two year degree and join this career track, you do your two year degree, you graduate and you go straight into the police academy and then you graduate from the police academy and you are a certified police officer and, and ready to be hired. And so well, that's you've good. kind of been living the world for two years and that's it, that's a really good program. Is there a max age, 19 through? It's We can't have a max age. No max age, that was his question, not mine. Yeah. Just confirming. <laughs> but Mr. Look, I'm kind of long in the tooth here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working. Mr. Barry Parker also has a question, but he agreed to unmute himself and ask the question live. So this will be our second live question. Mr. Parker, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. Uh, good evening, Chief. My question is, um, does the police force use body cameras? Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about body cameras and the use of body cameras. And I don't remember ever seeing that. And that's why my question is such. Yes, sir. Uh, we do not use body body worn cameras at the Port St. Lucie Police Department. Um, we have presented it to the city council on multiple occasions and uh, it has come up as a debate amongst the council and we've never had a majority of council members vote to do it. And um, I can give you a little background on that because each time I've had to pre um, prepare that presentation um, to do it right, to do it where we meet with Florida public records laws and we, were, and we would be able to have that information readily available and, and uh, archived would run us about $700,000 a year. And um, when you look at our internal affairs complaints, 
Um, over the course of the last five years, we've had one excessive force complaint, and that was an unfounded complaint by someone who was arrested. So while I would love to have body cameras, um, just like I would love to have a helicopter, <laughs> um, at least Alex is laughing. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> um, it's the necessity is not there. Additionally, um, as the research has been done on body-worn cameras, um, they're not living up to the hype that, that they were given. Um, they don't change police officer uh, behavior like they uh, anticipated they would. They don't change citizen behavior like they anticipated they would. And uh, even worse for the people who, who were really adamant about us getting them is the body-worn cameras in a lot of jurisdictions are being used as a prosecutor prosecution tool, and I don't think that's um, what people had in mind when they said, go spend a million dollars on body-worn cameras. So um, for me, it would make my job much easier, though, because I could just go to the video on almost every complaint that I get on uh, whether it be rudeness or, or any other um, complaint, and uh, we would have video to, to go from. Um, some of the issues that you see across the country are when do you release the video, you know, <laughs> And um, I would be, if we had them, I would be very transparent and the video would come out very quickly. And I can tell you in um, those cases, sometimes the victims aren't happy with the video being released and see it as an invasion of privacy. So it's, it's a very com complex topic, but uh, um, we're not against it. It's just the, the, the need has not risen to the level that justifies the, mm -hmm. uh, the expense. Thank you. Thank you. You ready? Next, mm -hmm. next slide. All right. All right. So this is our flow chart of the department. Um, since we made this slide back in the spring, um, getting ready for this, uh, we have actually been authorized to have 10 more officers by the city council. So our full strength, authorized strength as of October 1 is 261. And we were authorized for another civilian. So that brings our civilian to 75. But um, the departments broke down into three bureaus. Um, you have, you know, um, first there's the chief, and then there's two assistant chiefs. One's over the neighborhood policing bureau, which is pretty much everybody that wears a uniform. And then you have support services bureau, and that's uh, all your detectives, whether they be um, general assignment or property detectives or persons detectives or drug detectives or gang detectives and then all of the support functions like evidence and uh, you know, uh, the record section and that kind of thing works for support services. And then professional standards. Professional standards uh, is run by a lieutenant currently and uh, we have a couple of sergeants in there and professional standards is internal affairs. Um, also our staff services sergeant does all of our training and recruiting and then we have the accountability and analysis uh, section, which I talked earlier about accountability. And uh, so we've devoted an entire section to that. And uh, you see a bunch of acronyms under there. And I think later in the presentation, I'm gonna get to those. But uh, we basically uh, have a series of meetings at, on a daily, weekly, and monthly, and then annually. Um, each meeting is comprised of a different style of agenda, but they're all um, designed to hold people accountable for what they're supposed to be doing. Any questions on the flow chart? I mean, I could talk about it a lot and we could get into the nitty gritty, but it tends to not be a super hot topic. Most police department flow charts look pretty similar. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the breakout. There's one chief, two assistant chiefs, nine lieutenants, 37 sergeants, 187, which now it'll be 197 police officers. 75 civilians and uh, about 54 crossing guards. So uh, it's uh, quite the little corporation. So I'm charged with ensuring the department is uh, doing everything they're supposed to be doing. And um, I actually have five direct reports, not just the two assistant chiefs. Um, I have a fiscal manager, um, the lieutenant in internal affairs for, reports directly to me, the PIO, um, and then a couple of admin staff. So uh, um, that's, that's kind of what the administration of the organization looks like. There, there's a couple of pictures of uh, 
our PIO at the top uh, at the time was Sergeant Lisa Marie Carasquillo. She's uh, she was down at TV 25, and um, that's a recruiting recruiting booth there in the bottom, and uh, that's myself and my wife and the director of the Children's Home Society um, there uh, when they were uh, recognizing us for our contribution to their endeavors. Do we have a new PIO? We do. We um, just recently, one of the things I like to do in a police organization is, is prepare um, people coming up through the ranks to someday be in my position. And uh, one of the things that um, I didn't have access to as I was coming up the ranks was to move around the organization. It turned out I was pretty good with computers as computers came into policing. And I kind of got pigeonholed into uh, being the computer nerd for the department and got stuck in one division <laughs> of the organization and uh, never got to be a detective. And these guys love to tell me that when I start asking questions about an investigation. <laughs> uh, you were never a detective. Mm -hmm. you know, which I reply, I stayed in the Holiday Inn one time. But <laughs> you know, yeah, this is, this is my, my jokes are bombing. They're not, they're, heads aren't even bo bobbing up and down. But anyway, um, so... With, I like to move people around the organization. Um, a lot of times they don't like that. They get comfortable doing their job, and as soon as I think they're comfortable, I'm like, guess what? You're getting a new job. So we recently uh, switched PIOs. Uh, Lisa Marie went and she took over the new gang unit that we'll, we'll talk about a grant that we got, and she's a former gang detective, so she's great to start up a new gang unit. And, um, and Sergeant Keith Boham is now our new PIO. Excellent. Yeah. So. Great philosophy, lateral movement. Yep. So I get to stop talking here in a minute. Um, this says Milo training because we originally were just going to do a very short segment on our Milo, and Milo is our uh, simulation training, but um, it kind of morphed into a much bigger video. And uh, interesting enough, I have no idea. I'm going to watch the video with you all for the first time. I have uh, the communications department came over and got with our training staff, and they, they made this video. And uh, I just know it's not just Milo, but uh, I have seen the first 30 or 45 seconds, and you're going to meet Officer Jimmy Olson. He's our one of our training officers. Um, he is a world-renowned um, self-defense instructor and also a competitive shooter and uh, just an expert in all fields of uh, uh, defensive tactics for police officers. And uh, he's going to, he's gonna, at least in the first 30 seconds, he's going to, tell you about our training program and I think he's going to show off some of the uh, different tools we have for the job so yeah. roll my name is Master Officer James Olson with the Ports and the Police Department I'm one of the two full-time training coordinators and our job is to make sure that all the officers receive the required training they're supposed to have every year according to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and then anything we find out in the environment that we think is no going on around town Friendly. around the country and we think we need to get uh, the officers trained up on, we go ahead and we apply those as well. The main things we're focusing on today is going to be that Batman utility belt. So everything having to do with firearms, defensive tactics, use of force, taser, uh, that's all going to be uh, shown today. We're going to demonstrate uh, the different types of weapons that we utilize. And then we're also going to get into our Milo system, which is multi-interactive learning objectives. And it's a video simulator that puts officers in different scenarios so that the first time they see it is not out in the street in a real encounter. And it gives them a reference to what to deal with when they encounter something like that. Hi, welcome back to City University. We're going to talk about the, the weapons that we issue to the officers and the tools that we give them to help better do their jobs. So we're going to talk about our primary firearm that we issue to the police officer. And the primary firearm is a Glock Model 21, which is a 45 caliber gun. This is the one that we give to the officers as a primary firearm. We do have a few officers that have a smaller version of this one, and it's the Glock Model 17, which is a 9mm. And what that does is it allows for the hand size of the officer to accommodate to the weapon. Because if we haven't done that, then the use sometimes is inefficient. So if I have a really big grip and a small hand, sometimes it doesn't place where it needs to. So we accommodate it to make sure that all of our officers get the best equipment for their individual needs. The next thing we go ahead and we get into is going to be our full-size rifles. The rifles that we issue our officers are set up. It's a standard AR-15 civilianized version. And the only difference between the civilian version and the military version is this switch here. This switch allows the officer to select from safe to semi-automatic which means that when you pull the trigger, one bullet at a time comes out of the gun. It's much more controllable, much more accurate, and we are efficient with that way. We've also given the officers the added tool of putting on a red dot and a magnifier. 
Now the purpose for this is to go ahead and allow the officers to get a better acquisition. The red or green dot that's inside this uh, optic here allows it to project on the object, not like a laser, but actually superimposes it so it makes it appear to be on there. And it's a lot faster to get good acquisition much more accurately than utilizing the traditional iron sights, especially if we're talking about night or low light environments. And then the magnifier is one that moves out of the way for the officers so that if they're trying to get a more clear picture of what's going on, all right, sometimes they have an issue where it's a little bit further away and they want to get in closer to see, is this truly a threat? Then the magnifier helps them with that as well as giving them more precision shooting. The next tool that we issue to the officers is going to be a shotgun. We have a couple different variations. Um, one is a Remington 870, which looks just like this one here, only the furniture would be black in color, right? And then we also have the Benelli semi-automatic shotgun, both chambered in 12 gauge. Each one of these tools um, kind of has their niche, right? It's, it fits in a certain need. And they have to qualify with every weapon that we do issue to them. Now back over to this orange shotgun, the nickname is the Sherbert shotgun, right? This one is our less lethal shotgun. Now we say less lethal, some people refer to as less than lethal. Now these are set up just like our regular shotguns are. The orange forend and stock gives us the designator that it is a less lethal tool. And then on the side here, we have the side saddle. And this is where we store the munition. These are less lethal, not designed to cause serious injury. And like I said, we have two different types of munitions here. We have the beanbag round, which is the yellow one. And then we have the rubber buckshot rounds, which is going to be the black pellets. As anything else, like we said, these are tools. The biggest weapon the officer has is their, their mind. We say get the software working so you don't have to use the hardware. Um, it's just one of those things that fills in the void when the circumstances present themselves and says this is the right situation to utilize this tool. Um, but this, again, being less lethal, it allows us to get further away, safer, and deploy it from a distance where it minimizes injury while also keeping the officer safe. Now, this one here is going to be our taser. Now, on the front of the tasers, you'll see there are cartridges here, but these white ones, clear front doors, are actually our training ones. These allow us to put them into the taser, and the taser will function as if it had a real cartridge in it without propelling any wires out of the front of it. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. And you're going to see, put on the wall over here, the two dots. The two dots shows that the top one, the solid one, is where the top dart will go. The flashing bottom one shows us approximately where the bottom dart will go. So it gives the officers a very uh, precise area where the rounds are going to go. So when we do deploy these, we stay away from sensitive areas such as the chest, neck, and face. I'm going to turn it on again. Right, I'm going to point it off to the side and let you guys see that it actually is going to spark a little bit. Again, nothing's coming out. But we can see the energy flowing across the front of those. Uh, and all the officers that are working Road Patrol carry the taser as a tool. Now, the next thing we have on the table is actually part of our tools that we have for the Milo system. And you'll notice if you look on the table, they're just like the ones that are above them. We have the blue taser, right, which is the inert version that's going to work with our video simulator, and then we have the red handle one that does the same thing. It shoots out a laser, and these interact with the actual screen, and it's going to go allow us to go ahead and utilize these tools just as if the officer were on the streets and grab the same tool off that Batman utility belt to go ahead and see which one's the effective tool for the circumstance they're in. We're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to the actual Milo simulator. Uh, that'll be the next thing you'll see up on the screen. And we're working on next is our video simulator. The acronym is Milo. It stands for Multi-Interactive Learning Objectives. And what we do is we bring the officers in at least once a year, sometimes more frequently as time allows, and we bring them in to let them work on their skill sets, work on their accuracies as far as their fundamentals of marksmanship, and we bring them in and let them work scenario base to see if they can work on their de-escalation skills, the decision making, the shoot, don't shoot scenarios we may put them through. Okay, so this next scenario we're going to show on the Milo system is going to be a traffic stop uh, where the officer has to engage with another subject um, during that actual traffic stop. How you doing, sir? Can I get you to turn the motorcycle off for me? Turn that down, please. Thank you very much. I'm Officer Olson of the Portsmouth Police Department. Do you know why I stopped you? I was just going to take off, sir. Oh, we'll try to get through it as quick as we can to inconvenience you. All right, just stay by your bike. I'll be back in a few minutes, okay, sir? Excuse me, sir. Can you stay by your bike, please? Thank you. I'm just running the computer system. As soon as it comes back, we'll go ahead and deal with that. You were speeding a little bit. We need to address that, though. I understand that. I just have to verify the computer system. There's nothing else. All right. You're way back here anyway. This is my patrol area, sir. How come you're the only one out here? That's, now, what's to stop me from taking you out right now? That's not really a good idea, sir. So I need you to stay by your bike. Can you do me a favor? Put the helmet down, please. Put the helmet down, sir. Sir, don't make me tase you. Put the helmet down. Stay away from me. Stay back. Don't clench your fists. 
Stay back. So in that aspect, we were actually dealing with, there was a couple issues we came across. A large male appeared to be uh, unhappy about what was going on. He was uh, upset that I pulled him over and the time delay was going to take him. And he actually made some subtle threats to me. If you were listening to the video, you heard him say, what's going to stop me from taking you out? Have you called for your backup yet? So because there was some distance, I chose to go to the taser. By utilizing the taser, it gives me that standoff distance, again, from 9 to 25 feet and allows me to go ahead and attempt to neutralize the subject to get him under control without causing serious injury to him or allowing him to cause serious injury to me. If that thing were to escalate more, then sometimes the taser is not the appropriate tool. So we put these officers through the scenarios to give them an example of this could happen to you in the future, and it's a Rolodex in the back of the brain, so when I see something that's similar, I know at least a way to start the conversation and things going. We have uh, gone ahead and moved from our Milo simulator to our distracted driving simulator. And you can see that the setup here, we have our three screens in front of us, so it gives us about a 180 degree field of view for the driver. What we're going to do is we're just going to ask him to go ahead and navigate the road while trying to look at the nav screen and see if the distraction of checking the screen, simulating a cell phone or a navigation device, uh, causes him to have some difficulties driving. So we're working through a parking lot out here, so it seems to be a nice sunny day, right? No environmental problems that he's encountering. Now the system is fairly responsive. Uh, you can see as he's going through there, there's a the car went over the curb a little bit, so we have that. Sarge's so doing pretty good. He's driving down the middle of the road. He's taking his half out of the middle now. Uh, coming up to a light. So as you can see, out the left-hand side of the window, we actually have pedestrians walking across the street against the crosswalk. So that's something he has to be cautious about. Even though he's got a flashing yellow, he still has to use caution when he approaches these intersections. Because of people like that, you had the flashing yellow, and he actually violated your right away. But these things happen out there, and if you're distracted watching your screen, uh, watching your handheld device or something of that nature, we can see how devastating these things could be. Now, this system is used throughout the community. We take them to special events, and we allow people that are licensed drivers to sit behind the wheel, take out their own cell phone, and try texting a friend of theirs while they're driving. Uh, it gives them a really good uh, view and realistic response of how it is that they can't focus on multiple things. Uh, driving is a very uh, skillful type of thing that you have to constantly be monitoring your, your mirrors, monitoring your roadway, things of that nature that are going on, because some people aren't. And uh, even if you're doing the right thing, they might pull out in front of you inadvertently, and we've got to be, always be cautious and alert of what's going on. Okay. So am I back? back. All right. Well, I'm back, and I, uh, I hope that you found that uh, video pretty informative. Um, and if anybody's got any questions about anything in the video, please bring them forward now. I usually get a gun question. Well, uh, one of the questions was answered at the very end of the video. So the driving simulator is brought to events. Jen, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the other part of the question regarding Milo? Hi, everyone. I just wanted to know um, if Milo was available for civilian use um, as a demo or um, practice. Um, if not, is there a system that we can use as civilians to practice on? Thank you. All right. It's a good question. Um, as far as I know, the only civilian that ever bought a Milo unit was Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> and he did it while he was a reserve officer with the Miami-Dade Police Department. Um, but I, I believe Milo only sells to law enforcement um, as as a training device and their scenarios, I believe are copyrighted. Um, we do have a couple of scenarios in there that we do when we normally do our Citizens Police Academy or City University that we let you guys uh, try out. So that's a plug for the next Citizens Police Academy once we uh, get through this pandemic and start doing that again. But Definitely, but I'm sure there are a bunch of self-defense classes and gun safety classes that you can take that probably use similar methods right i don't know okay yeah, I'm, I'm we'll find out i'm not gonna guess but I, I will get an answer and i will get it to alex and she can get it back to you thank you it's all been, right it's been a while since i took a gun safety class okay all right um next up we're going to talk about the different bureaus and divisions in the port st lucie police department and and i'm not going to mm -hmm. get into a lot of depth in this i think everybody's um, watched enough tv i'm just going to point out where our organization differs from what the traditional idea of what a police department is and uh, point out this point out the similarities 
Uh, the first bureau we're going to talk about is Neighborhood Policing Bureau, or commonly people think of that as Road Patrol. And uh, it has two divisions in it, patrol and, and district support, and it's just like it sounds. Um, one, one is on patrol and the other one does all those ancillary uh, type activities like traffic, marine patrol, uh, honor guard, and, on, and canine and on and on and on. Um, the second bureau is support services. I kind of alluded to that earlier and that's run by Assistant Chief William Vega. And that is your um, animal control division. Uh, in criminal investigations, operational support services, property and evidence, and uh, special investigative division. Uh, interesting enough, uh, property and evidence section, that's a 10,000 square foot warehouse, um, completely full of things. And uh, you wouldn't believe the stuff that's in there. And all that has to be maintained for court and then just properly disposed of and, and the accounting to go with it. It's, it's quite the endeavor. Uh, that bottom picture is uh, Sergeant Charles Lumpkin and uh, Detective Kristen Meyer, and uh, they're operating a radio directional finder, um, practicing looking for someone who, uh, a person who has gone missing that's wearing a special bracelet that we uh, facilitate getting out to folks that are having uh, cognitive issues or dementia. And uh, if you ever run across a situation where one of your family members would need such a device, please contact us. You can mount the antenna on a drone, Avi. You, you can. Not our drone, but oh. we don't have one that big, but yes, um, you can be done. Uh, yeah, put that in the budget, right? <laughs> Funny enough, we're going to talk about budget in a minute. <laughs> um, so the way we uh, divide our city up is we have four policing districts. The uh, the four districts are everything east of the St. Lucie River is District 1. The area between the river and the Florida Turnpike is District 2. And then Districts 3 and 4 are west of the Turnpike and divided north and south by, uh, and this is where I could walk over to a map if we weren't doing this visually, but where the light blue and the purple, that's the C-24 canal that runs almost east-west through the city. So District 4 is St. Lucie West area, and District 3 would be everything south of that canal around the Gatlin Tradition area. Um, you'll see it in a little bit. Currently in the process of building a District 5. Um, Mattamy Homes is actually building it. I'm just building the staffing to police it. But uh, um, you can see District 3 is very, very large compared to the other districts because it was um, less sparsely populated at one time, but it's quickly uh, catching up. There you go, Avi, budgets and grants. So as you can see, um, and this graph's a little hard to read, but it's hard to get all the information on a page. Um, we'll talk about the grants first on the um, left-hand side of the page. Uh, we receive five grants from the federal government, um, totaling about $440,000 a year. And uh, the top one is the VOCA grant, that's the victim of crime. Um, and that is given to us so that we can have victims advocates to, to uh, make sure that we're representing the victims um, the way we should be. And they, they work on behalf of the victims of crime, either with the police department or with the prosecuting department and all the way through the court process if necessary to uh, make sure that their rights are protected and um, they're, they're getting their due process and justice. Um, the next one is a federal JAG grant, and uh, JAG stands for Justice Administration Grant, and that is money that flows to the city of Port St. Lucie directly from um, the uh, Bureau of Justice, and that is for special projects that I haven't budgeted for. So we usually buy high-tech equipment like drones with antennas on them, Avi, and, uh, but we've, uh, this past year we've been buying some bulletproof uh, shields for the road patrol officers, these fold up Kevlar shields. State JAG grant is exactly the same thing. That is uh, money that flows straight to the police department from the uh, state of Florida. And it's in under that justice and administration umbrella. And that again is for special projects that we would not normally be able to budget for, that we can send a request to them 
and they will vet out our idea. And if they think it's something that's admirable, then they will provide the money for us to do it. And then BVP, I'm drawing a blank. I should have studied harder. Um, I think it's a bulletproof vest. And then um, the Heroes Grant is, uh, is money that flows into the department from a specific foundation to make sure that we uh, are able to do the things that we're not budgeted for. So, volunteer program. Oh, we didn't even talk about the budget, did I? Wait, and before you go on, there's a question. Yes. Uh, Rick and Lori, would you unmute and ask your question? What types of things do you use the drone for? So Abby's kind of Abby's a drone pilot for the city communication department, and I'm actually um, one of the people who's certified for the police department to fly drones, which I don't get to do as the chief. But um, so we have this drone thing going on. But uh, we they use them to make shoot movies and, and do some really cool stuff to uh, communicate the successes of the city. We use them for searching for missing persons, photographing crash scenes from above. Um, in a limited capacity during uh, SWAT operations to uh, gain a tactical uh, visibility advantage. Um, but mainly uh, missing persons is, is our main uh, activity right now. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, and, and you know, we could use them in a wildfire. It, it, it's anything you could use a helicopter for, we can do it a lot cheaper with a uh, unmanned aircraft. So talking about the budget, um, basically you can see that, uh, you know, in 15, 16, we were about $40 million a year. And you can see how that was broke out, um, whether it was capital outlay, operating expenses or salaries and benefits, and then how it, it has gradually gone up as our number of personnel have gone up um, over the years. Uh, about uh, 80 I think it was 87% of our, our cost is just salaries and benefits. Um, and then second of all, obviously is operating. Operating would be gas, fuel. That usually runs right in the neighborhood of $6 million. And then uh, the, the little tiny gray sliver at the top is the capital outlay, which is um, police cars and equipment okay? or buildings if, on the rare occasion that we had a building. But uh, most of our money is tied up in, in uh, personnel cost. Any questions on the budget? Alex left the room, so you're just going to have to unmute and ask. I don't have any questions. All right. Thank you. All right. One of the things that we find to be an extreme force multiplier for us is our volunteer program. Um, this is... Uh, it started years and years and years ago, and it has just grown and grown, and uh, it has become a tremendous asset to not only the police department, but the community. And you can see some of the uh, statistics here. The volunteers in 2019, they logged 11,000 hours for the police department for free. Um, you see that in, in 10, I was talking about on the drone, or we were talking about putting it on a drone, that they were using the track. That's Project Lifesaver. Um, that's a national company who just happens to be headquartered right here in Florida that does the, uh, the um, tracking devices. And uh, our volunteers go out and visit the, the clients that are wearing the uh, tracking device, the bracelet, and make sure the batteries are charged up. And they made 151 visits last year. They uh, had almost 900 hours of crime watch patrol, and uh, they watched over 312 homes for people who had requested it while they were on vacation. Um, we have ACID. It's our criminal investigation division volunteer who himself worked 433 hours working on 235 cold cases that uh, the detectives just didn't have enough to go on, but they wanted a second set of eyes to look at. And then we have um, a whole group of chaplains. You see them there in the middle picture around the uh, memorial. Um, and they, uh, they work with the uh, officers um, and the citizens, depending on the needs, um, often respond to the scene of, of a tragedy to make sure that um, the victim or, the, or, or relatives of the victim receive the uh, comfort that they need. But a uh, tremendous group of people, the volunteers, and uh, we wouldn't be the police department we are without them. Is there a question? Can you take two questions? Yes. Okay, Robert Olsinski, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, 
Hello, Chief. Uh, my question to you is, currently uh, Port St. Lucie is 120 square miles. You have 250 officers, that is 0.48 per square mile, providing they work 168 hours per, <laughs> you know, per week. How do you manage to have such a safe city on your budget? So you're, you're gonna scare your classmates and, and you'll notice you're nowhere in the uh, presentation that I talk about how many officers are working at any given time mm -hmm. in the city. But if, if there's any HR folks in there, they, they'll, they'll tell you there's a, there's a thing called uh, the relief factor and uh, there's some other factors that when you calculate manpower that um, it pretty much daytime you have a few more. You have, you have some specialized units working during the daytime like uh, traffic. But uh, at any given time, there's not more than about 24 to 26 officers working that entire 126 square miles. Hmm. So uh, um, it's really about being efficient. And that's why we're so proud of the volunteer program. We're so proud of our uh, crime reduction model. We're, we're really proud of the way we do business, the relationship we have with the community. Because like, like you said, if it was just uh, 26 officers trying to cover 126 square miles, um, it wouldn't be a very good prospect of us being able to, to uh, muscle our way into a safe city. It's a great question though. One more question from Joyce B. Joyce, can you unmute yourself? Hello, Chief. Hello. I'm uh, asking about the chaplaincy program. Do you, is there a training program for that or is there, what is the process to get involved with the chaplains? So I would have to direct you to our volunteer coordinator, Tom, um, and, uh, and I will uh, get his number on when we go on the break and uh, I'll have Alex text it to you or uh, message it to you. Will do. Um, Tom Andrews, our volunteer coordinator, and uh, he'll tell you the exact uh, requirements of the chaplaincy, but I believe, uh, you know, it's kind of an on-the-job training with the other chaplains, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, really, you just got to show up with a caring and compassionate heart and a willingness to do something good in the community. And, you know, as long as you don't have a criminal record, we'll probably give you a crack at it. <laughs> Thank That's you. Weird screen. Is that what it looks like on their end right now? Yeah. Look at that. That's I'm what ghost. it looks like. <laughs> I'm a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Avi was trying to be fancy there. All right, let's continue. You didn't know it was going to be the big top tonight, did you? <laughs> um, police department performance measures. Um, these, this is the things that um, we measure and at the city, city level to make sure that um, we're giving the city council um, what they want from their police department. Um, and I'm not going to go through these. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty basic stuff. Um, but if you look at it, it's pretty consistent with what you would believe a growing city would be like. Um, the calls for service are going up. Luckily, or correspondingly, the crime rate is going down as the population goes up, which means the actual number of crimes is slightly going down as the po and the population is going up. So we're kind of maintaining the, uh, the efficiency we were talking about earlier. That's pretty rare, I would say. It is, um, in, in, I think I've got some slides in the end here on uh, crime rates and, and traffic crashes and things, um, but it comes down to having a strategy and um, we stumbled onto and, uh, a really great strategy that was put together by a couple of wonderful people that one was a lieutenant here and his wife was a professor who used to work for the cops um, agency out of Washington, D.C. and uh, they would both PhDs and did a lot of research and they came up with what they thought would be a pretty good model and we tested it over a 10 year period and refined it and it's turned out to be uh, very good. And, uh, awesome. Yes. Um, so. so by the numbers, uh, you know, everybody talks about data and data is very, very important to the way we do our business. And uh, one of the things that's really important to the city is how do the citizens feel about um, their city and how do they feel about their police department. So um, when we did the last national citizen survey, the results were 79% of the population said they feel safe, 96% said they lived in a safe neighborhood, and 91% uh, said this community was safe overall. Um, 
Our crime rate is uh, 1,000 per 100,000, so 1,036 1, crimes per 100,000 population. And uh, that was a decrease over the previous year by 6.9%. And over the last uh, nine years, it's decreased almost 40, 48%. Um, one of the biggest issues that get brought to my attention, whether it's at a city council meeting or when I'm out in the public, is the traffic in the city, and I, and I, I get it. Our, traf our roadways have become increasingly uh, congested, and uh, people have become increasingly rude in the way they drive. And uh, so we stepped that up about four years ago. We started stepping it up, and uh, last year we wrote almost 30,000 traffic citations and warnings. Somebody was raising their hand. Is there a question? Just cut it out of the corner of my eye. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll keep going. Uh, city of Port St. Lucie strategic plan. Um, the city council that normally sits at the dais behind me, their number one goal is a safe, clean, and beautiful city. Um, and safe is my responsibility and the police department's responsibility. And uh, in that goal, we have two initiatives. Create that fifth district to patrol the tradition area and... Uh, our traffic safety education and enforcement program. And those are the two we're focusing on, in addition to keeping crime low and doing all the other things that we do with the community. And uh, speaking of the community, um, these are just some of the nonprofits that we partner with. Um, we think that uh, if there are nonprofit organizations that are willing to do the really hard work and keep the government from doing it, then as uh, servants to the community, we should do everything we can to support those nonprofits. And, uh, and you can see um, everything from the Police Athletic League to the uh, American Cancer Society, the Pace Center for Girls, Heart Association, um, Boys and Girls Clubs. We try to get involved with every one of those groups so that uh, they can accomplish their mission. And a lot of times um, by partnering together, we're able to be a force multiplier for them. And I believe we're coming up on another video, aren't we, Avi? We are. All right. You can click on the clicker. All right, I will. Um, but I want to introduce this video. Again, I haven't seen this video, but I know what this group of guys is like. Um, we have a tremendous canine unit. Um, Mike Colton's one of the um, most renowned canine trainers in the country. Uh, he often travels all over the world on his off-duty time to train canines in, in different countries. And... Uh, the rest of the crew are um, quite a bunch of characters, and they're, they've got well-trained dogs, and they love what they do, and I think you're going to enjoy this. They just, uh, they're always a hit. I wish, I wish I was as popular as a canine unit. Good afternoon. My name is Officer Will Harris from the Port St. Lucie Police Department. I am a police canine handler for the city of Port St. Lucie. I've been a handler for 15 years. Currently, the Port St. Lucie Police Department canine unit has five canine teams, which consist of four narcotics and patrol certified teams and one explosive detection and patrol certified teams. We use the dog for everything from tracking a suspect and locating that suspect to uh, deterring a suspect from running in the first place. The first exercise we're going to show is an article search, which is when a dog uses the latent human scent that's left behind on a material object to locate that object uh, for evidentiary purposes. And then we're going to demonstrate a tracking scenario where the dog is going to follow a trail of human scent left behind from a subject to where that subject is actually hiding. So I'm going to let them off. I'm going to tell them to search this area. The article that we're looking for is not in this area, but what I'm trying to do is get him ready to work. Now I want to gradually walk into the area that I know where it's at. Good. Check. Good check. Good. Here. A port. Good. Ah. Good. A port. Good boy. Good. Show me. Where's it at? Where's it at? Ooh, good boy. What happened is the dog worked the wind to his advantage. If you saw them going back and forth, we call that ping-ponging into the scent, moving upstream to where the odor is more available, and he uh, pinpointed where it's at. So I'm going to go up to him now and pay him. Woo, that's a boy. That's a boy. Good. 
So right now we have a decoy who uh, pulled up a truck and fled from the vehicle. So we would do, this would be more like if it was a um, vehicle pursuit and the suspect bailed from the vehicle. And now road patrol units would be setting a perimeter because we know he's somewhere close. And they're right now requesting canine. Myself and canine Jackson will arrive at this vehicle and deploy. And we'll be demonstrating tracking. So we'll be showing you what the dog does with the tracking a suspect who is actively fleeing and hiding. This little tracker that's uh, actually linked to our computer system that all the computers, every officer has this tracking system built into their computer. So when you're on calls and stuff like that, you can see exactly where every officer is in the, in the city. Our canines have them on attached to their harness. Every officer that's on the perimeter will be able to see exactly where we're at. And so when we come into contact with the suspect, they'll know instead of us giving our location, dispatch or another unit that's watching will be able to say, hey, they're right here and bring units to us and get us back up. Port St. Lucie Police Canine, let me see your hands. Our dogs are selected and purchased from Metro Dade Canine down in Miami. The dogs come via the Czech Republic or Slovakia. Typically, they're imported to the country. When we go down and evaluate the dogs, they are usually green, meaning that they've had a little bit of bite development and very little else, very little human contact and socialization. We select the dog based upon a variety of tests. When the dogs are selected and purchased, they come back to the city of Port St. Lucie, where we put them through an approximately 500 uh, our uh, academy where the dogs are taught all their patrol disciplines and then they have an additional time added to that school where they learn their secondary discipline which would be their narcotics or explosive detection. We're required to a minimum obligation of five years of service or five years commitment to work a particular dog barring any health reasons that may uh, prohibit them from working. After that five-year period, their health is evaluated uh, pretty regularly. And as long as the health of the dog does not create a dangerous situation for the handler or for, for the dog team, um, they can stay in service, some of them as long as nine, 10 years old. All of the dogs, uh, when, when they're in service, do go home with the handler. We spend a lot of time with the dogs. We, we often joke that it's the only 24-hour day, seven day a week, 365 day a year in job in law enforcement. But the dogs do live at home with us and our family. They get assimilated into our families. And then after the dogs retire, the handlers have the option to retire the dog to the house to become a, a family pet to live out the rest of its days, which all of our handlers that I know of so far have chosen to, to keep each of their retired dogs. We typically stick with the shepherding breed of dog. Their size, they're you know, medium to large size dog, but they're still agile in their build. Being selected for canine is kind of a long process in that uh, we're required to have at least three years aggregate service between prior experience or three years with the uh, Port St. Lucie Police Department before we can apply. We encourage members of the police department that have an interest in canine to come out as regular as possible to volunteer to help us decoy and things like that so they can see um, how involved it is and so they can also see what it's like from the experience of other handlers what it is like to assimilate a working dog into the household. It is a long-term commitment but it's, it's definitely worthwhile and it's I believe the best experience in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, we had two questions that came yep. in on break for K9. What was the first question Alex? So the first one was how much do the dogs cost? So the basic cost of what uh, Officer Harris referred to as a green dog is about eleven thousand um, dollars, and that's after we uh, have them medically checked out to make sure that they're um, we're not we're not buying anything with a problem. Um, but then we invest a lot of money into them after we we first buy them. Uh, they have to spend six months in a canine training academy um, before they go to try to get certified. And it's just like the police officers, actually the dogs get almost as much training as the police officers do. And it takes two officers to train a dog because you have to train, you have to have a trainer and the handler. So uh, so when it's all said and done, we've got about $20,000 invested in, in the dogs. But uh, that's another force multiplier. I mean, you saw how, how well behaved they are and uh, the way we reward the dogs. I guess it's not really rewarding the dogs, it's rewarding the handlers, but, um, after so many felony apprehensions, the dog gets promoted to sergeant. And Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and then after so, and so many more, he gets promoted to lieutenant. Um, that's it. Then no, no dog gets to promote to chief. But um, <laughs> but they have all their badges on their yeah, harness, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So usually the, it doesn't take long before the dog outranks his handler. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads into the second question that they have obviously proven to be very effective with lots of um, situations across the country and the world. They were particularly effective in a Bass Pro robbery. So how many canine units work on each shift? So we, we have some overlapping, but we try to have one on each shift. Um, so we have evenings and midnight shift. And then we have two squads. And uh, the, um, the dogs, we try to have like an A shift and a B shift on, on each, uh, or A squad and B squad on each shift. So that accounts for almost four dogs. And then we have the bomb dog and the explosives detective dog who doesn't do, he, he is patrol certified, but he doesn't do drugs. Um, so they all, each one has some specialties, but uh, it's usually one dog per shift and uh, they float the whole city, but sometimes they do overlap. All right, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Great, so the next thing we're gonna do is talk about the strategic plan, the city's strategic plan, and how the police department fits into that. Um, our first goal is, uh, as we talked about earlier, is safe, clean, and beautiful for the city, and we have a strategic initiative that's our, which is encompassing of safest large city in the state of Florida. Um, is what the council has set for me. And the priority project for that right now is to implement District 5 on the west part of the town. And you can see that highlighted in the slide in the, uh, the reddish or pink uh, there where we're planning on breaking up Districts 3 and 4 into 3, 4, and 5. Um, what we have slated for the plan is 24 patrol officers, um, six sergeants that would be for those the A and B squad on each of the three shifts and one lieutenant to be the district commander. Um, and we were gonna build that out over five years of hiring um, new officers and promoting people. And then uh, that should, as we've kind of tried to time it as the population booms out in the tradition area. And of course, that's not for free and I apologize for the slide because if it's as hard to read on your screen, it is on mine. Um, you can't really see it, but um, it's it's going to come out to uh, about six million dollars over the five years to do that. Um, one of the interesting th things about um, building out like this is uh, everybody that's built a house here in Port St. Lucie remembers a nasty little surprise called an impact fee, and uh, I myself. Um, and down that road. But uh, what we do is that we get to charge a law enforcement impact fee for everything that's developed in the city. And that is so we can afford to buy the equipment to field those police officers as the city expands. So all those homes going in at Mat Mattamy will be paying for the additional equipment. And that includes cars and guns and uh, radios and bullets and every uniforms, everything it takes to field a new police officer. Yes, ma'am. What you got? Chief, there's not a physical building in each district, correct? No. So what we have, um, we did used to have a police station out on Rosser Boulevard, um, and uh, I really like that station. I actually uh, drew the initial footprint of that building as a lieutenant on a napkin and handed it to uh, the architect when we first started talking about building it. But during the economic downturn, um, we realized that um, we, we had to downsize the police department by almost 60 positions and we realized that we were duplicating a lot of effort to operate two buildings. So we had to have a commander and we had to have a records crew out there and we had to have another crew to, to be the police service aides and that uh, greet people at the door and it was just a lot of stuff being duplicated um, and it was best just to recentralize back to headquarters and we geographically deploy the officers now and our shifts overlap the way we're doing it. So there's always a police officer in the zone, but the central core operation of support is here in the middle right next to City Hall. Any questions on District 5? All right. Um, one of the things we're very, very proud of is our annual uniform crime report um, in this particular slide shows you uh, that 
Um, we have had the, the lowest crime rate of a city with a population over 100,000 uh, for the last 10 years rolling, but it also gives you a 20 year graph of um, how, we have, how we've done when it comes to crime and crime rate. And the graph part of it, the blue line is the crime rate, the, um, I'm sorry, that's the total crime index and the blue line, the red line is the crime rate and the bottom line, the, the slightly off colored blue is the population of the city. So the difference between an, the crime index and the crime rate is the crime index is the actual number of crimes committed and it's not adjusted for population. The crime rate is the number of crimes committed divided by 100,000. So when I told you earlier that we had the 1036 crime rate, that is a 1,036 crime rates per 100,000 residents. So it's actually, there was a couple thousand crimes. And that's what you see here in the graph. You'll see that the uh, blue line's about twice as high as the red line, and then it's the slight differences in their par them being parallel has to do with the population changes. Um, but what's cool about this graph and what's exciting is if you look at the index crimes, the index crimes are lower now than they were when the population was below 100,000 and we're over 200,000 in population now. So we've doubled the population and crime is lower than it was 20 years ago. So way to go, Port St. Lucie residents. I mean, that's my, not many cities have that going on for them. What they do, I mean, oh, here we go. This slide just kind of gives you a, um, you know, a, a different way to look at the data. Um, total crime reported, you can see it's definitely trending downward over the last five years. And then the second slide is the clearance rate data. So this is um, the crimes cleared by the, by the department. Now don't ever fall for the fact that a cleared crime is a pro successfully prosecuted crime. A cleared crime um, it could be an unfound, it was unfounded, and it could also mean that uh, we know who did it and they were deceased and we weren't able to prosecute them. But uh, the FDLE and the FBI have very specific criteria that we have to meet to call a crime cleared. And we have had a very successful um, crime clearance with our crime reduction strategy. I usually have an ex-law enforcement officer in the room, in the class that wants to talk about that a little bit more. So yeah. keep your eyes peeled for a question. Um, the types of crimes that the FBI counts, what they what they call the Uniform Crime uh, Index, are UCR crimes. Um, part one are listed right there, and those are the numbers. And uh, we broke them out by council district. And this is a little thing that makes being the chief of police interesting. Policing districts and council districts are not parallel, and uh, there's a reason for that. The council districts are divided up for pop segments of population and to keep them equally sized, and policing districts are done based on geographical boundaries to make them more efficient to patrol. So remember I said District 1 was east of the river, the river being a geographical boundary that would be hard to get back and forth across during your patrol shift. Um, and same thing with the turnpike and same thing with the C-24 canal. So we try to break our district patrolling districts and zones up into pieces that make sense to patrol efficiently and effectively and uh, not necessarily equitably for the officers. And they soon figure out which ones have the highest crime in them and where they're gonna be doing the most paperwork and then uh, as the more senior officers know which zones to pick as time goes on. But. Uh, any questions on that? It just kind of gives you an idea how it breaks out. Lots of compliments coming through. Oh. Email and, and here, so Excellent. Thank you. All right. And last thing we're going to look at with uh, crime rate um, is uh, just a quick down and dirty uh, comparison of Port St. Lucie to St. Lucie County. So Port St. Lucie is the blue line. St. Lucie County is the green line in the state of Florida is the uh, red line and just kind of gives you a, kind of a shakeout on uh, how 
we as a community compared to our bigger uh, subdivision or subset of the state, the county, and then the, and then the state we live in. A lot of times you'll see uh, uh, us compared to other communities. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times that comes out of a result of the talk. It's, you know, we're the seventh largest city in the state of Florida. We're bigger than Fort Lauderdale. How come their crime rate six times what ours is? I'd like to caution everybody, not, don't get caught up in that too much. Um, Fort Lauderdale has a booming port. They have an international airport. They got a lot of things that I, as the chief of police, don't have to deal with here. So um, you have to be very careful when you're comparing yourself to other communities. But if you're looking for a good, safe place to live, that's why I raised my kids here. I'm proud of it. Safe, clean, and beautiful. Our strategic initiative number two is traffic safety and vision. Everybody, we kind of talked about this earlier. Everybody knows in Port St. Lucie, the traffic is always booming and carrying, and, and uh, we have um, heard our citizens and um, we have stepped up our enforcement, but correspondingly, we've stepped up our education. And um, we think it's very, very important to uh, utilize the Florida Strategic Highway Safety Plan. And um, one of the pieces of that is Vision Zero. And uh, we, we are concentrating on engineering, the streets to be safe, working with our public works department, educating our drivers um, on why um, they need to drive a little bit slower and pay closer attention and not be distracted. We're stepping up our enforcement efforts. Um, we, we like to give those who have short memories a, a nice reminder so that maybe they can uh, remember to slow down a little bit. And uh, we're also concentrating on emergency response so that when something bad does happen, we get medical services to the people as fast as possible so we have a better outcome. Speeding and aggressive driving have been identified as the two things that uh, put people in, in peril the most on our highways and streets. Um, so our strategies are enforce speeding and aggressive driving and uh, do that at high risk locations. So we look at crash data to determine where we should be doing our speeding enforcement. And we also use citizen complaints to help us uh, direct our patrol units. Um, we also use technology. I don't know if you've noticed, but, um, and I don't know why Public Works doesn't have a big flashing sign up on Crosstown, but if you get off I-95 and you get the um, green light, if you drive 45 miles an hour, and uh, you can go all the way to US-1 and never stop at a stoplight. About nine, nine out of 10 times in a row, I've been able to pull that off. I do it most days coming to work. Drive 45 miles an hour, um, that I would be that white Tahoe in the center lane going the speed limit that everybody's trying to get around that is blowing his siren going, look, I don't have time to pull you over. I've got a meeting to go to, but slow down. Um, but uh, very, and you also notice there's usually an officer or two sitting in the median out there writing tickets. So um, we've worked really hard on uh, using technology and we've used, you've started noticing signs around the uh, city with uh, reminders to people that they're speeding. The speed limit sign with the flashing speed underneath it. We've been buying those with uh, drug dealer money that we seize. And uh, we like to evaluate crash data and look at hot spots in that data and uh, then look at engineering to clean, that, clean up those um, bad spots. Uh, years ago, Abington and Savona was the dangerous intersection in the city. Um, it had had several uh, fatalities at that intersection because people would run the stop sign. We put a roundabout in there and we haven't had a fatality since. Um, <clears throat> and we like to do uh, education. I talked about that earlier. Um, interesting little slide there in the middle. Um, two, in 2018, speeding killed almost 5,000 or 10,000 people, 9,378 people nationwide. Um, 30% of the males and 18% of the females ages 15 to 20 year old were involved in uh, fatal crashes for speeding. And uh, so we know youth are more, have more of a tendency to be injured by speeding. Um, we also know that um, speeding drivers involved in fatal crashes, 25% um, of those didn't have a valid driver's license. And that's usually because they're habitual traffic violators. And uh, 31% of all motorcycle riders killed were speeding at the time of the crash. So speeding is very dangerous. 
Okay, moving along. The next video we're gonna do here is uh, we usually have a live interactive um, session with our SWAT team at City University, but uh, they have recorded a video here. And before we go into the, um, the SWAT video, I wanna tell you that this is probably one of the most controversial things we're gonna to show tonight, because I, I, I do believe in transparency. Um, but in the last five years, I would say that we have gone back and forth over tactical policing uh, um, more times than uh, I, can, I can think of. And uh, it seems like something happens in the news media and everybody says demilitarize the police and then something else happens and they're like, well, why didn't the police stop that from happening? Um, so the two examples I can think of are Ferguson, Missouri, um, where they, they wanted to ban police from wearing camouflage and wearing tactical gear. And then fast forward a few years later and we're in Parkland down in uh, Broward County and you have an armed suspect with a semi-automatic rifle shooting children and the officers didn't respond fast enough. So it's always a very um, hard line to straddle. Um, and like most topics in policing, you have to have one foot in chaos and one foot in order and you have to get back and forth across the line multiple times all the time. But uh, I can tell you that having highly trained officers who can take on um, determined armed suspects is important in every community. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it with the best equipment and the best trained people we have. And uh, we have a great track record with this group. And uh, without further ado, I'll take questions afterwards. But I can't wait to see what our communications department did with my SWAT team. <laughs> Your gun should be on safety right now. Finger off the trigger. That's the way we move. That's the way we practice. Right. The SWAT team is comprised of four elements. We got our crisis negotiation team, our explosive breaching team, our sniper team, and the entry team. All four of those fingers put together make SWAT. So the entry team, basically we work from the outside in. These are the guys that are putting their lives on the line. Right. They're going inside a, a home or a building where there's a hostage rescue, there's an armed barricaded subject in there. This is why it's good to train. Come out, you have these problems, you work on them, you make sure they don't happen again. We have our life priorities that we live by. Innocent civilians are first, officers are second. Uh, suspects and then property. So entry as a last resort or entry to save, you know, a human life, a hostage life. Stand by, stand by. Fire! Sniper element provides cover for us. Uh, they provide overwatch, they provide intelligence. We get to the scene and then at that point, we start basically what we call assessing, you know. First, we're gonna try to find where to go, where to hide, where to do our hide. They're gonna tell us the things that they can see that we can't see. They're in hidden positions, different hides, they call them. We don't want to be close, but at the same time, we don't want to be too far away. We want to be, our, the most important thing is going to be, a, be in a field of view that we can see. Second, we'll start giving out some information of what's happening, what's going on in the scene. They give us a lot of information in order for entry to do their job. And then lastly, in regards to our hide and stuff like that, is we have some, we need some protection, some ballistic protection, if we can find it. Yeah, but the most important thing, like I said, is that field of view. We, be, we need to be able to see. Our breaching team is comprised of entrymen who are specially trained in explosive entries, uh, energetic entries, hydraulic entries, ways to get into the building. There's four of us that are assigned to the breaching element. This here is a breaching shotgun. It's specifically designed to allow immediate access, emergency immediate access into a, um, a locked area. So whatever the call out may be, whether it's a high risk search warrant, armed barricade, it could be a hostage rescue, we're gonna deploy with all this equipment regardless. So although I'm a breacher, I still carry my rifle. So once the breaching mission is done, we transition our roles now to an entry element and we can still handle business that way. This here is our breaching facade. We can load any type of door in there, any type of window. If somebody wants to get data breaching concrete or hurricane glass slide or whatever whatever we can think up, 
we can put in that frame, tighten it down, and build around it, and make it as realistic as possible. We practice that, we train that, and uh, hopefully we'll never have to use it. Uh, because we do rely on the fourth entity of our team, which is CNT, which is Crisis Negotiation Team. The goal for the negotiators is to get on point, fast, establish communications, because if we're talking to somebody, they're not hurting somebody else, and they're not hurting themselves. Find out if he's in pain right now. They're working the phones. They're working the intel from our drone squad. We have a primary negotiator, and he or she is the one who is primarily doing the negotiations. That negotiator has a coach, which we also call a secondary. We also have a scribe, and we also have one of the assistant team leaders that are inside as well that is running it. They're getting as much info as they can, and they're trying to peacefully resolve, trying to negotiate with whoever the bad guys are in whatever the case may be. We don't know how many more people are inside. We live and breathe that everyone is going to come out safely. Um, real life happens, and sometimes it may not work that way, but that's not, we're not going to train that way. We are going to train 100% that we're going to end this peacefully. So that's the purpose of all four entities, and I would say this team right now is the most talented it's ever been in the decades that I've been on SWAT, and the support that we get from our agency is at its highest level. From Chief Bolduck to Chief Del Toro and Chief Vega, I mean, those guys, they support our, our mission. Um, the council supports our mission. Uh, the mayor supports our mission, the city manager supports our mission. So we are highly supported. We you know, are here to do a specific job. We don't abuse it, and we get the job done. We're back? Yep. All right, and we're back. So I'll, I'll tell you, uh, um, coming up through the ranks, I often competed with the SWAT team for uh, funds. and. Uh, Sometimes they would get some shiny new toy over there on the team and uh, my whatever I was working on didn't get his shiny new toy. Or um, Now I'm the chief, I can tell you, when you have to make the call to send those guys into action, you absolutely want to do it with the very best equipment and the very best training that you can possibly muster. And uh, um, knock on wood, um, we have a tremendously professional team and the outcomes are always great. So we, I'm sure we have some questions on SWAT. Actually, none yet, but maybe people need a little time to, to think about it. There is a question on a slightly different topic. Okay. Uh, that's waterways. Okay. I don't know if, we've if we're going to touch on it or, or not, but do we have the same capabilities on street that we do in the waterways? And st does PAL get um, sent out onto the waterways as well? That was the question. Pal. PAL Police Patrol? Okay, so the, the um, PAL we normally think of as the Police Athletic League, which is a nonprofit that we support yeah, but right. um, to educate children. But um, we do have a Marine unit, and the Marine unit is stationed, the boat station down at Canal Point Park at the intersection of the St. Lucie River and the C-24 Canal. Um, but that is, a temp that is what we call an ancillary duty. So uh, what we do is uh, on special weekends, um, most weekends in the summertime, we were, we're able to uh, skim a couple of the Marine unit guys off of road patrol and let them put some time in on the boat. And we try to jumble that around so that the boaters never know when they're going to be working. And then obviously on the high activity holiday weekends, we always uh, do an overtime detail to get the uh, Marine patrol guys out. Uh, I hope that answered that question. Okay. All right, Avi's got a question. <laughs> I, I would have to go back and look at the data, but I can tell you historically, yeah. we, we normally um, run about three to four call outs a year. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and that's not counting high risk search warrants. So, if, um, we do a threat and matrix on um, when we get a, a search warrant for someone, we do a background on the individual or individuals in the house, and, and then, of course, whatever the crimes are, you know. So, if you know, if they're making bombs and, and running assault weapons, and we're obviously going to use the SWAT team, but you may have an individual who is a, a habitual drug runner who's also got a history of homicide in his past. So that would be a high-risk search warrant. But we, gotcha. we actually put the information into a matrix and decide whether we're going to use the team or use uh, trained detectives to do the search warrant. I have another one. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Guys, as the SWAT team, uh, do they ever 
exist yeah. anyone now? How do you guys? We do. Um, we, I, since I've been the chief, we've uh, obviously we've partnered with St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office on, on a couple of cases. Um, we've had them come to us. We had a really long standoff one time with an individual and had elements from this, the county and from Fort Pierce Police Department that we train with on a regular basis come in and, and relieve some of our SWAT operators because you, you don't want to leave somebody on station too long and they get tired. And a uh, tired officer in a high-risk situation is a recipe for disaster. So we try to rotate them out. And, but uh, we've also um, done high-risk search warrants for the FBI, uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Homeland Security, all, you know, it's not like TV. That's that's one thing we talked about in the beginning. I was going to tell you the difference. It's not like TV, folks. Um, we get along with our partners at the FBI. Um, we had some bank robbers come into town one time from Fort Lauderdale, and we had in advanced intel. I was riding with the resident agent in charge of the FBI, and uh, we were running a dual-purpose command post out of his patrol vehicle. Uh, and so, um, it's it's there's not that war that everybody thinks is going on between us and the feds, or us and the sheriff, or uh, state troopers we get along pretty good all right moving along all right now we got a question so one of the questions we have does PSL have a no knock policy okay yeah so um, no knocks one of the uh, hashtag eight can't wait that I talked about earlier we do not um, we, we do not routinely use no-knock warrants. Um, we, the only time we would use a no-knock warrant would be an instance like I talked about earlier where there's an extreme um, reason to do it. Like we're going to hit a house where we know there's going to be people with assault weapons in it. Um, we actually uh, have adopted a principle. We don't really like to do entries anymore. So uh, we usually breach and then call out instead of going in to avoid the gunfight inside the house. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's safer for everybody. It gives people a minute to get their wits about them. Um, we're clearly announcing who we are. We're set, set back at a safe distance. Um, so um, try to avoid avoid that immediate uh, confrontation. So. There's another question on here. All right. The other question we have, um, in the Treasure Coast, is PSL the only city with SWAT team? No, no. In the Treasure Coast, um, I'm not, I don't know about some of them, but I do know that uh, Fort Pierce has a SWAT team, uh, the Martin County Sheriff's Office has one, the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office has one, the Vero Beach Police Department has one, I believe. I'm not sure about Sebastian and Stewart, but, um, or Sewell's Point, but, um, that's a, that's a thing when a city this size, um, you, you want to be able to uh, control the, the, the level of training that your, your tactical unit's going to have. I think I have a follow-up question. Right. Um, <clears throat> where is it? Hold on one second. Um, how much interaction is there between the Sheriff's Office and PSLPD? Good question. Quite a bit, um, both at the command level and, and at the different various unit le um, levels. Um, the sheriff and I and the undersheriff and I meet at least uh, once a month and have lunch. Um, sometimes we meet for breakfast um, just to, to hash out um, something that may have popped up on our radar screen and sometimes just to get caught up with each other. But uh, um, the assistant chief and the majors at the sheriff's office uh, talk on almost a weekly basis and uh, our Gang unit works with their gang unit, and they have various places you know, where they crisscross, uh, whether it's in meetings or just sharing intel with each other. Uh, the road patrol officers back each other up on the road. It's not uncommon to see a sheriff on a traffic stop and a PSL officer backing him up or vice versa. Um, so, yeah, we work, we work very well together. Um, uh, I have another question here. I believe it follows the no-knock policy. Um, Jen is asking, who signs off on those warrants? All search warrants have to go through a judge. So um, if we want to do a search warrant on someone's house, um, we fill out the paperwork and we vet it very carefully. And we also, um, in our organization, 
have a separate set of eyes vetted to make sure we got the right address and the right house description. And it's not just by address. You actually have to describe the house. So it's, um, I'm not going to use anybody's address. I was going to use my, my address, but I don't live there anymore. But let's just say the address and then a description of the house. So it would be a white house with blue trim with a mailbox on the left side of the driveway and a, and a the, you know, the, the garage is in, on the right side of the house and, and it's like very, make it very descript. Um, cause, because in the past we've had issues, we haven't, but law enforcement has had issues with hitting the wrong house, going into the wrong house. In addition to that, then that information is supplied, the probable cause for the search warrant is supplied to the state attorney's office and they vet that information. And if they're satisfied, then they give us the go ahead to take it to a judge. And then um, the circuit judge will look at, I think any county judge can do the search warrant too. They'll look at the probable cause for the warrant and make sure that it meets all the legal requirements and uh, that there's, there is a good reason for us and we have, we have the PC to uh, enter the person's house and then they will go ahead and sign off on the warrant and then we, we can uh, plan to execute it. How long does that process take? Uh, you close? <laughs> so from the time you guys sent in the warrant until you get it back signed and getting the okay, like what's the time frame on that? So it, it depends on the exigen exigency of the circumstances. Okay. Um, if it is a routine investigation and then we'll, we'll We'll do it over the course of a couple of days and get it get it signed off. Um, if it's a active shooter or a homicide scene and we don't know if somebody's still alive or dead inside and we need a search warrant, um, we'll wake the judge up to get the warrant signed. Yeah, we'll wake the state attorney up and uh, we'll give them a heads up to meet us at the judge's house and then literally we'll sit in front of the judge's house and the state attorney will read the warrant and he'll approve it and then we'll go wake the judge up. So uh, it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. And, and trust me, you don't want to have a bad application for a search warrant while you're, when you're waking the <laughs> judge up. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, we talked about traffic earlier, and I did want to show a graph, a couple of graphs, um, to uh, talk about speeding in, in uh, our enforcement efforts. Uh, as you can see, that is a, uh, I can't read those little bitty numbers. It's about 10 year graph. Yeah, it's a 10 year graph on uh, speeding and or speeding traffic citations. And you can see that uh, they went down pretty dramatically um, in the early, uh, like 2011 through 2014. Um, and then we heard the cries of our citizens that they wanted more enforcement. And uh, we began stepping that back up. Uh, the, the top right is the traffic crashes slide. So as you can see, um, the crashes have been on a steady increase, and that's probably more to do with the population increase than anything else, but the, um, it appears that there is a correlation between a very high number of citations and a slight decrease in the number of traffic crashes. So it would be interesting to watch that data over the next few years. The most important um, Statistic to me when it comes to traffic crashes, though, is the fatalities and how severe the crashes are. A majority of the traffic crashes we have in Port St. Lucie are very minor in nature. People playing with their cell phones roll into the person in front of them or uh, distracted driving and they, they bump the person behind them. But uh, around 10 times a year, uh, people die in crashes in the city of Port St. Lucie. And that's what we really focus our efforts on trying to avoid. Um, as you can see, same type of graph I showed earlier for the crime rate. Someone has a magnifying glass and is <laughs> into the street with the mask. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry that I have you all with magnifying glasses trying to look at those numbers. I promise I'll upload the PowerPoint first thing tomorrow morning. It's just very large and, and difficult to download, but we'll get it up to you guys tomorrow morning. Thank you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I have it in presentation mode so I can see the next slide coming. So I've, I'm really squinting over here. Um, but you can see the blue line is Port St. Lucie. The green line is the state of Florida. And the red line is the uh, entire country. And the numbers represent crash fatalities per 100,000. So uh, we typically run in the neighborhood of around five or six, sometimes seven 
Um, and we have been actually trending down as the population goes up. Um, um, one might say as the conge traffic congestion goes up, it's harder to get going fast enough to have a serious crash. But, um, but one of the things that we've looked at is some of the different uh, data points out there. And the, the banner across the top, you may have seen that at Met Stadium, it's, 40, or it's 30 for a reason. Um, 10 miles an hour makes all the difference in the world if you strike a pedestrian. And uh, the city council is now seriously considering lowering the, the speed limit in neighborhoods to 25 to even lower the number of potential uh, serious fatalities down even more. So uh, please, folks, when you're driving a neighborhood, don't drive over 30 miles an hour. And if you don't have to, don't even drive 30 because if your kid does dart out in front of you, at 40, it's catastrophic. I have a, a question for you. Yes, Avi, you're turning out to be that guy. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I, I heard this question before. Um, if somebody uh, on the street keeps speeding, uh, what should they do? Should they just call 911? Should they use the one PSL app uh, to report? Like, what's the right way to uh, maybe have the uh, police officers kind of watch this street, specific street? So the one PSL app would probably be the most um, apropos way to, to, to deal with that. If you have a habitual speeder on your street and uh, you can narrow it down to a, a, the street and the time frame that he's doing it, and you go on one PSL and you give us all that information, I guarantee you we'll have a traffic officer out there hiding in the bushes within a couple of days and uh, we'll get him. And Because uh, that's, that's just uncalled for. Um, but if you need to call 911, like we talked about earlier, f please feel free to call 911. And, and the road officer can also take that information and get it over to the, he can either take it himself and go out and uh, work with his own partners to uh, catch that habitual speeder, or he can uh, pass it on to our traffic unit. And you won't be charged to call 911. You will not be charged to call 911 unless you do it from a payphone. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, We're at our last slide. Yes. And oh, wait, just one more question about school of uh, traffic. And this is, a, a, you know, last year was we really honed in on traffic education. It was a huge hot topic in all of the neighborhood meetings, you know, so we're we're constantly addressing it. And that was a really good question that Avi um, had. But the last one that we'll take here tonight is, how about school buses flying through your neighborhood? Should we contact the county? Should we contact the PD? Well, you certainly um, got two avenues there. Um, you can definitely call the PD and, and we'll, we will address that issue. Um, but I would also drop a, I would get a bus number and I would call the transportation director at the school board and let him know which driver um, shouldn't be speeding. Um, periodically, we do come across a school bus driver that needs a reminder that... Just because they don't have kids on the bus... Doesn't mean they couldn't run over one. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chief. Right. So, no other questions? That's it. You did a fantastic job. Covered okay. everything thoroughly. No like more questions. questions. <laughs> I, Avi wants some more questions. I tell you what, Avi, let these people go, go about their lives and you'll now have a conversation offline. But, but uh, don't forget, folks, if you see something, say something. And if uh, you know something about something that we need to know, you can always call Tre Treasure Coast Crime Stoppers, and uh, you can be anonymous. And uh, if you need to share information with us, you can always use the One PSL app, or uh, you can call the police department directly. And uh, if you see something that we need to know about in a timely manner, call 911. Don't hesitate. Reach out to us. You're our, you are our eyes and ears. And uh, you are what makes this community what it is today. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, Chief. Thanks, Alex. And thank uh, you all. Maybe we'll see you at graduation if you're able to stop by and say a quick hello. If you got room for me. Definitely. All righty. Good night, thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much. Tonight was a wonderful session, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Don't forget, 3.30 in the west parking lot of the Civic Center. Or, excuse me, 
Event Center. Good night. <laughs>